Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's Connie conversation. From idea inception to real world solutions. Really delighted to be here with you today, um, or this afternoon. Um, and uh, we're very, very, very um, excited to introduce, which I will do shortly, our guest, Bill Martin. Um, but I did just want to thank you for being here and to really encourage you um, throughout this presentation to drop some questions uh, into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And Sarah's gonna um, keep reminding you to, to go ahead and do that because we really um, enjoy this presentation to be interactive and it really is designed to be a conversation. With me is Chris Moore, who's Associate Director of the Connie Institute, and he and I are going to be talking with um, Bill Martin, who uh, is a PhD graduate from Brown University um, and is currently the Global Therapeutic Head of Neuroscience at Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies uh, of Johnson & Johnson. So Bill, um, you know, I was just... Uh, kind of remembering going back and we, I think we met in 1993. <laughs> I think it was maybe even 91 <laughs> actually. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. And I was, I was a new assistant professor and you were a graduate student. Um, and isn't that amazing? Like, I just, I don't know, like just how those early connections with someone and we were chatting and it was just kind of fun and I was completely new. Um, and now, now suddenly, like we're talking here today, it's just I know, great. it's amazing. It's great. <laughs> um, so, Bill, you you graduated from Swarthmore, Swarthmore grad, Brown PhD, postdoc at UCSF. You um, started your um, work in therapeutics at Merck, moved through, did a number of amazing things, a number of companies, and and now look at you. <laughs> <laughs> So brilliant career. It's um, just a reflection of age, I think, Diane. These things just happen with time. Yeah. Um, I just I was actually reading, you know, we have a connection to the site of neuroscience as well. And I was just like scanning Google as you know we do. And I found this freelance star newspaper cutout from uh, 1995 from the San Diego Society for Neuroscience meeting. And you were in the newspaper then <laughs> as a graduate student. There's a headline that says marijuana chemical also painkiller. And and it was just highlighting your work with um, Michael Walker. Oh, Michael was amazing. You did your PhD with him. So yeah. It was yeah, it also tells you about what you work on is what draws attention sometimes, right? So um, it was really good science. I'm you know, old enough to to say that I started grad school in the month that the um, the paper on the cloning of the cannabinoid receptor was was published, and so that puts it in perspective. You know, before the receptor, people thought these were non-specific effects, couldn't possibly be you know mediated through a, a cell signaling system, and uh, and now look where we are. Just thinking about you know back then, you know, some of the early work you did was really important uh, defining you know, the endogenous ligand for the cannabinoid receptor and its importance in, you know, endogenous forms of analgesia, but like, where are we now? And, you know, how, how much do we still need to do? But really, really, really beautiful work with Michael that you did um, then and continuing through your career. So, um, you know, I will we'll talk a lot about all the many different things that, that you've done, Bill, and just been incredibly successful in so many different areas. And I think that's going to kind of get to my first question. You know, many of us, um, you know, you find your thing and you do your thing and, you know, it's, you, you've, you've done that in many different areas, but, but with incredible success. And I just kind of would love for you to just start to talk about like what, what motivated you to <laughs> are you very successful, hot areas, amazing training, great area. And then you're like, yeah, I'm going to do something just a little bit harder now. <laughs> like I yeah. see, you know, so what, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, there's so a couple of, did you, did you yeah. have a plan? <laughs> well, a, a little bit of a plan. I mean, I would say that there's something, you know, a, a liberal arts education gives you. And I think Swarthmore, like Brown, was one of the things that drew me to Brown. I think there's a kind of shared philosophy there is that, um, you know, you really, you begin with an idealism 
and the sense that you know, you can make the world a better place. And for me, I thought maybe science was a way to help realize this. And, you know, that started as, as my, my core purpose, I guess I would say. And so in, in that way, I suppose there's a plan. I think the second part of it is that I um, have a short memory for anything that might be defined as a success. So when I wake up the next day, I kind of forgot what happened yesterday. And I think I need to be better and, and help others around me be better. And uh, I think that's been another kind of motivating factor. So, you know, have a core purpose and then along the way, sort of treat people well, recognize that we are always playing a team sport and everything I approach throughout, you know, every juncture along the path, I, um, I just tried to sort of show up with a sense of curiosity, humility, um, uh, I guess the one part is, is probably not a, a positive reflection, but in terms of the full disclosure, interest of self-awareness, I, I do see the world a little bit through the lens of dissatisfaction, you know, and, and, and uh, just thinking the way things are are not as good as they can be. And I combine that with a sort of sense of urgency for change and, and how to help catalyze that change. I just feel like that, that, um... That liberal arts education really just got at a new goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are always surprised. They're like, well, how can you do that? How can you do that? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm just trained to think. Like, I, I don't know. I couldn't possibly be trained in all that you need to know today, 30 years ago, but I'm trained to think. I think I've done that part okay. <laughs> Brilliant. So, you know, again, continuing on that thought, like you've, you really have um, uh, really made some great advances and really pushed therapeutics through the system. And I'm just wondering um, maybe if you had a couple of examples you could share with us, you know, perhaps like what, give some a couple of examples of that. And then like, what were the friction points and, you know, what did you do or the th things that you can, tell us about how you tried to overcome some of the barriers that, 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 that you encountered? Yeah, well, I think in terms of being able to translate and uh, help translate insights into potential new therapeutics, you know, one of the things that was appealing about going from UCSF uh, into Merck is, as you, as you referenced, I was working uh, in pain during my graduate years, continued that work in pain modulation, uh, trying to understand you know, transmission and modulation at a variety of different levels. And um, it was also an age where, you know, we were learning a lot about uh, tools and methodologies for being able to probe ion channel modulators, as, as you have done nicely in your work. And so one of the appealing aspects about Merck was being able to, to work on a, a program for novel sodium channel modulators and uh, novel sodium channel blockers. And you know, it seems funny now, given what we can do with high throughput patch clamp and things, but at the time, being able to screen thousands, tens of thousands, actually even hundreds of thousands of compounds uh, under conditions where you had some voltage control was really considered a big breakthrough. So that was uh, the technology, if you will, that kind of, you know, Merck had been working with other academic institutions to help develop. And, and, and that was the kind of entry point uh, into my role as a bench scientist there. And, was fortunate to, to take kind of a step from a rock that I knew into a rock that I didn't know. And um, in that sense, bring you know, my expertise around sort of uh, thinking about systems, electrophysiology systems, pharmacology approaches, uh, you know, uh, behavioral models, all as it relates to pain and analgesia and to combine that with these emerging technologies. So I was very fortunate through that uh, context to be able to kind of grow with this program, which is, you know, then and, and still now a very interesting target for pain modulation uh, to wind up leading a cross-functional team. Uh, so folks from all different aspects of, of research and development as well as the commercial side and, uh, and led that team through the early development phase and then the product development phase, you know, into, um, into patients who had what's called post-herpetic neuralgia. So uh, it's a chronic neuropathic pain condition that follows from a you know, a herpes zoster outbreak. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's funny, you, again, you started with praising my success. I see uh, genuinely so, you know, a lot of the failures along the way. And, and I think what I've always tried to do, and this was one of those, so, you know, 
proud to have gone as far as we did. And then when we, when we got into patients, you know, didn't demonstrate the kind of um, clinical efficacy that one would have hoped to sort of support continued development. But instead of seeing that as kind of a failure per se, I just sort of took that as an opportunity to, to learn all those different components of, um, first of all, what's required to go from an idea to a molecule, uh, you know, to, to taking that into people but also then recognizing why things don't work. And you know, the, the iterative nature of, uh, of testing, a, you know, forming a hypothesis and testing a hypothesis and of course revising it. And this is one of those instances where, you know, again, you'll hear me say this a lot that uh, you know, really the continuity between what you might call academic and industrial research is in you know, that sort of hypothesis generation testing and, and sort of refinement. So, um, you know, I, it's, uh, I can continue, let me sort of switch into your direct question about the friction points, which is, I, I guess I don't really see them as friction points. I mean, I think in the sense that um, if I reconceptualize, you know, the work that we do and, and try to, again, see things through uh, kind of good intent, listen, friction points of people not understanding whether we should go in this direction or that direction, you know, it's an opportunity to listen for me, uh, to listen, to get better, to sharpen the focus, and that kind of notion. Whenever it's an apparent friction point, actually, it's probably a gift that's helping you kind of refine your thinking. And this goes all the way down into writing and revising papers. You know, I remember being a grad student and a postdoc, people get very upset with the, you know, the referee comments. And, and to me, it's like, oh, no, no, they're doing me a favor. Like the last thing I would want is for a paper to go out with, you know, the kind of concerns or critiques that, uh, that they're surfacing here. So that's been the approach I've taken in terms of, you know, friction points, if you will. I think the last thing I would say in terms of trying to help overcome this is really, I, I've said it before, it's this notion of it's a team sport and, and people help you overcome these things and being able to, you know, develop the, the, the so-called soft skills, uh, communication, uh, alignment, alignment around vision, alignment around execution. Um, this is, I think, these are some of the key aspects of, of sort of acceleration of innovation. It's, um, it's one thing to just kind of bring people together, but actually to bring the right people together who can, you know, imagine what can be, not just what is. Um, you know, that winds up being, you know, one of the other gifts. So if you, people like that who have a bias to action, uh, they've always been my teammates in this notion of uh, accelerating innovation. Yeah, I, so you covered a lot of ground there, I'd say, you know, like in the earlier response, you mentioned the importance maybe to put a broad stroke over that of, you know, that, that there's a target that you've identified and this is important, but to understand in what context. <laughs> And I think that that you were, you know, certainly leading that very early on. And, you know, the idea that that you can modify the activity of something, but, but it really depends, you know, how is it, what, what form is it in and, and what organ is it in? And, you know, it, I, I think that that, it sounds obvious, but but that was not being done there. Yeah, that is a persistent, and so this is a theme. If there's a through line, there's probably a couple, but a through line through my career is uh, that, for example, I talk about learning from, uh, you know, from the so-called failures and, and something like post-herpetic neuralgia, which we, you know, it has an etiology. We know people had an infection. We kind of know what happens at the peripheral and central nervous system. But in fact, you know, what we learned then, which I've continued to sort of carry with me is that, that's a heterogeneous condition that you can have an infection and the way it presents itself in terms of the contribution of sodium channels is very different. You might have post neuralgia that's calcium, calcium channel driven you know, at the level of the spinal cord rather than sodium channel driven at the level of the peripheral nerve or, or dorsal root ganglia. So that notion of heterogeneity and like, you know, breaking down these categories into the underlying biological constructs, that is clearly one of my through lines. You know, years and years, when I left high school, I worked with, um, I worked in a drug company with Jim Black, who you probably know, but most people don't know. Uh, we refer to him as Sir James Black, I believe, uh, most of us, but yeah. As small as you want, you've got to come back to the organ. <laughs> so, so it's just like really kind of stuck, stick it, stick, stuck yeah. there. Anyway, we, so I think you, you also raised, um, and I'm going to flip over to Chris and let people, I just want to remind everyone, you know, put your questions uh, into the Q&A um, if you um, so desire, but we'd love you to do that. So uh, you, you talked a little bit about academia, 
um, you know, an industry and I, I, maybe not using those words, but I think <laughs> that, that, that transition point from, you know, many ideas um, are coming from, from across the disciplines and across different um, uh, institutes and, and sectors, right? So, so it doesn't, there's, there's not a one way flow and you and I have probably both read Pastor's Quadrant. I, I, that's really influential work for me and having come up in the industry as well. Like that, that there's this, I think, an unhelpful distinction between um, you know, basic science and academic research, and then and then thinking about this other place, which is you know applied, <laughs> an industry where, of course, there isn't really, there shouldn't be that distinction, but maybe there still is structurally. And so I'm wondering how you, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about. Do you see that there's a structural? Um, distinction made there. I think I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think yeah. because it's not helpful. And then maybe like just leveraging the moment that we are in right now and Jane Jane being the news and vaccine development and how extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, scientists getting together, massive problem. Like that, that's an extraordinary moment where, that we're in. We're in a, an, an amazing moment. Like are there, can that be translated? Can we capture that moment? And think about neurological and psychiatric disorders that you yeah. spent your life. With. I think there are there are some parallels there. I think that um, the first is this question of research paradigms and basic versus applied. Um, and I think the first question that comes up and 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 it ties into vaccine development is, you know, what's the purpose of the framework? <laughs> the frameworks kind of come into existence for something, and and most of us, if not all of us, know that this is truly a both and proposition, not either or. But when it comes to funding and things like that, people become very concerned. So, you know, the challenge I've always had with it is uh, what are the boundaries and how do these boundaries shift over time? You know, we can go all the way back to somebody was studying, I don't know, the adaptive immune system in, in bacteria. Uh, do we know that was going to become, you know, uh, suitable for gene editing, uh, so you know, become the CRISPR system and the CRISPR-Cas9 that we know of. Do we know that that sort of sets us on a course for, you know, uh, so for for gene therapy? So I think the 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 bigger picture here is that when we can coalesce around sort of a common goal, we the scientific and broader communities, and I think this is another instance of vaccine development. You know, it just was never that popular, frankly. Right. It's one of those things that it's very difficult. People don't appreciate it. it's very difficult for it to be profitable, high risk of failure, all those different things. So what what did this require? What did this moment require? For the most part, you know, involvement and commitment of governments around the world to say this is going to be really important. And where we've done that as a broader community, whether it be antibacterials or others, you know, I think we can show the power of science. So that's what's special about what we've witnessed over the last, you know, 12 months. And I think um, we're probably, what, 12 months and two weeks away from the sequence of COVID uh, being published, SARS-CoV-2 COVID being published. And we go from that to, you know, a couple of different uh, vaccines with emergency use authorization, you know, being delivered around the globe. I mean, to me, this is a remarkable time to be a scientist. And I hope it's a time that we all you know, as citizens who sort of internalize and recognize the sort of the power of the ecosystem and, and the investments that we make in research, right? There's no reason to separate it from basic to apply the investments we make in research, you know, to provide that overall benefit to society. Selfishly helps reinforce that uh, idealistic vision that I had that science can make the world smaller, can science can make the world better. So I hope that there are lessons we can learn here. And I think what we're facing, and you've you've just touched on it, is what's the next pandemic, right? Is it is it viral? Is it or is it the consequences of you know the virus, or is it just what we're already living with, with you know spectrum disorders of of dementia and and, and related uh, diseases? I, I think this is going to require, you know, more of a collective effort than we've had in the, in the past. And to the extent we can move to collaboration away from uh, competition, I think we'll be better off for these kind of global global issues. It's, it's almost hard to know what to ask because there's so many threads to pick up though. But, but one of them that I know a lot of people are really interested in, and this dovetails with one of the questions we got in the chat. So I'm going to slightly 
I'll, I'll state it, but then I'll maybe put my spin on it. So one of your thesis committee members, who we won't name just out of a sense of anonymity, but says hello, oh. and, and put in the chat, you know, how, how would a person who wanted to <clears throat> sort of follow in your career trajectory get a chance to do that, um, give, given your path? But I think part of that question is, you know, you've actually helped found companies, but, you know, in, in your trajectory. And that's something that a lot of people I think are very interested in coming out of their PhD or coming out of their postdoc, but it feels like this amazing hill to climb. So is there a particular piece of advice you'd have about maybe that aspect of it? Although feel free to take the broader question from the Q and A given that you weren't- I didn't see the Q and A, so but let, me, let me just take the one you asked and I'll, I'll trust on you. I'll trust to you to translate the Q and A. I think, yeah. um, uh, so I, this notion of starting companies, I mean, first let's demystify it. Uh, Chris, Diane, you've started companies, right? You've, you've had an idea, you've raised capital, you've hired people, you've deployed the people and the capital in an environment that helps you test, uh, make progress on those ideas. So, you know, I think that the notion of starting a company, first of all, uh, it, it's not, it shouldn't be again so distinct from some of the work that we already do naturally in setting up a lab and setting up groups and getting grants and all those different things. So it, it should be encouraging means that you're already training for this, right? So there's already an awareness that this is kind of what you're training for. But I think if, if people ask direct advice, um, I, I, I'm hesitating here because I'm kind of like, I, I always think about this image of, you know, when a, a dog runs out and starts chasing a truck. And, and in my mind, I'm always like, well, what happens when a dog catches the truck? So like, so I, I ask the question, I think about that all the time. People are like, oh, I want to start a company. I'm like, but why? Like, what is the motivation to start a company? You know, is it personal? Um, is it, uh, you know, the problem that, that needs to be solved? You've identified a unique problem that nobody else has seen. I ask questions around like, is it is it a company or a project? <laughs> like sometimes things are really good projects and they should be funded and person, you know, prosecuted and all those different things. Should it become a company? I don't know. Well, one of the um, uh, the sort of levers there is is around intellectual property. So very practically speaking, and and you've heard me talk about this is, you know, the I don't know of a company that started without intellectual property. The source of the intellectual property can come from different places, but intellectual property is at the core of the companies that we start that are sort of science-based. So understanding what that means, like I have an idea, I disclose this idea to my tech transfer office that might or might not become a provisional patent filing. There are things I need to do around record keeping and disclosures, all of those components, you know, are at the core of it. But to me, those are just tactical. At the end of it, it's like, why do you really want to do what you're doing? Because you ask about like a, a high hill to climb. It's like, you know, every mountain without a base camp is an incredibly tall mountain to, to climb. But with base camps, like with places that you can sort of anchor yourself and move to the next level, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's viable. And I think for, for me, I'm an old entrepreneur, right? I waited, I don't know what it was, 15 or 20 years or something for the for the last company to start the last company. So it's um there are people who do it faster, right? They come out of brown and like, this is a great idea. I'm gonna go start a company. And I applaud them and they get support from the community and that's awesome. That's not the path I actually took because my motivation was not about starting a company. It was not about the how. It was really about the why. And I could pr prosecute that why in a variety of different sort of uh you know industrial scientific context. Yeah, <clears throat> that's Awesome is is so if, if people know what their goal is and then a company is the right way to reach the goal, then it's going to be intuitive. Probably this not intuitive, but then it's a knowable thing. What steps do you want to take to get there? What base right. camps do you need? Yep, exactly because you're about the goal. You're not about yeah, just like you just perfectly said the how, not the why. Mm -hmm. um, so in in Blackthorn, in one of your your enterprises. You, you were using AI to do drug discovery, which is fabulous. It intersects with a lot of people's interests here in machine learning and uh, using it for the benefit of the world, but also for you know, creating new things that uh, are real in the world. 
can you talk to us about the, that process? Are there, yeah. are there victories in it yet? Drug discovery takes a long time, of course, yeah. but are there good examples of it working? Can you give us a little like Jeez, content? I, on that? I didn't realize, I, I mean, the, um, you know, it's one of these things in 2015, the idea that somebody would pull together uh, computational and clinical neuroscientists in an industrial context to work on drug discovery and development, believe it or not, was kind of a radical concept. So going back to that friction point, like that was a friction point. Like, why would you want to do that? Well, these are not two people, not two groups of people who talk to each other. So I, I and now I smile because it's 2021. People are like, of course, we're using machine learning and AI to help drug discovery and development. You know, it's going to be the equivalent of uh, I don't know, somebody writing papers at the beginning of the 20th century about the use of electricity to advance manufacturing. I'm probably not because you use electricity, right? But how you use it and, and uh, some of the details there have mattered. So it, it really, Blackthorn was born out of uh, the journey that started with Merck in the sense of that uh, the heterogeneity in patient populations, the failure to sort of link mechanism to patient and patient outcome. And that's something that stuck with me. I, I, I wound up going into my next company, working in different spaces. I happened to, while I continued to work in neuroscience, I also worked in cardiovascular and supported drug development, discovery and development programs and respiratory disorders and in um, and, um, and antibiotics or antibacterials. And I learned something from each of those, like going back to the organ concept, the organ really matters, right? So the heart, how it relates to the lung and the kidney, like these things really matter. In terms of uh, antibacterials, um, you know, again, we sort of take it for granted, but there's not a single infection, right? We actually determine what the kind of predominant uh, infection is um, in terms of the, the infecting organism, and we develop treatments against that. So then we fast forward, you know, what do you do as a neuroscientist when, as an industrial neuroscientist, when you see the unmet need increasing and, and companies in the field retreating? And by the way, rationally so, retreating because they're like the ontological gap here between what we need to treat and the mechanisms we have and the biological understanding, we can't really close that in a, in a way that's beyond sort of trial and error. So, you know, this was happening. So that's happening in the field, the field being industrial side. And then in the field of neuroscience, I'm seeing you know, some of the most exciting time that, you know, since uh, during my entire career, there was a revolution look at the biology and data science and computational power was that next revolution. And I think that um, that's when you think about sort of the asymmetry there of where others are and where others are not and, and how do you bridge that? So the approach that uh, I took was, you know, using data science to really address you know, the, the challenges that the field face. So what are some of those challenges? We often don't know when we, when we have a, what I would call literary construct of schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or whatever, that's not a single thing. It's not a single thing at a point in time, like in a person, right? There's a spectrum, that's a severity, there's a temporal component and the biology there, the mechanisms that are at play as you know, catalyzing the, the disease, contributing to disease progression, all of those can be different. So what, what did we try to do? So what we try to do is we're like, well, let's first of all, start with the patient. Let's, let's focus on what we call human-based models and leverage the power of all the data that have been generated. And now there's become quite a bit of data, brain-based data, you have multiple different consortia, uh, human connectome project, things like that and also seek ways of actually bridging you know, behavior and, and the brain by using a lot of the clinical instruments that are out there. So when you run a clinical trial, you need to be able to measure whatever you're seeking to measure, whether it's cognition or depression or something like that. Well, people have answered all of these questions, lots of different patients, lots of different instruments. And what we've worked on, and, and the, the, the we is really, I get zero credit, really talented team. We've published some of this work asking you your question about this sort of output is well, what if we could just run all the trial and errors, you know, in a, in a computational setting. So basically looking at a, a sort of a multimodal, multivariate kind of correspondence analysis, and then applying like a Bayesian rule learning to narrow down into the patient constructs that are responding or not responding. So that was the approach we took. We can't rely on, you know, schizophrenia, depression, Alzheimer's being a unitary construct. But what we can do is we can say, when people who presented with these symptoms 
answer questions in a certain way and respond or don't respond to a medicine, we can then ask the question, what is, what is the series of if then else statements that corresponds to treatment, you know, likelihood of treatment response. So the simple example that people use is this one of the Titanic is like, well, you know, there's a certain overall mortality rate on the Titanic and that mortality where it was modulated by class of service, you know, age and, and gender. Well, the same is true. It's like, well, somebody was in a depression trial, they responded or didn't respond. And the response was modulated by the extent of comorbid anxiety or the extent of comorbid anhedonia or whatever. And being able to quantify that, this was only power. I mean, actually, frankly, using algorithms that were conceived of in the 50s, probably reduced to practice initially in the 80s, but only in the 2000s, 2015s, whatever, could actually be run at a scale that would allow for handling of the multidimensional uh, data sets that are associated with psychiatry, for example. So I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's a little bit of a flavor of human focused models, you know, not just big data, but deep data, understanding patients well with as many things we can do, and really trying to use uh, biology and, and data science to redefine these disease constructs. Chris, also, like, th this links to one of the questions that was posed. Um, about like how do you think about the polygenic um, multi-dimensionality of, of of many of the diseases um, that are classed? I think you embrace it. You embrace it, right? Yeah. Questions like how do you think about like what do you measure? You know, are you are you basing efficacy of therapeutics on you know behavioral output? What what's the output that you're looking at? And like, you you described, you know, doing a lot of different <laughs> output measures, not a single one in parallel to, to, to look for those points of intersection, look at efficacy in multi multi-dimensional way, but I, it, it, it probably gets at the, the multi-dimensional nature of the underlying disease as well. And so do, do you, is there anything additional that you, you can say about that. So you use that to form the hypothesis and in terms of what we measure. So working in a regulated environment, we seek to measure what can be an approvable endpoint. So you form this hypothesis in a data driven, uh, you know, manner and then still link it back to the mechanism of interest. And so there is an ongoing clinical trial from my last company that's, you know, probably posted on clintrials.gov or whatever that speaks a little bit about how you would use this approach to enroll uh, patients with a certain sort of phenotype, baseline phenotype. And, you know, uh, jury's out on on the status of that. I don't know anything more than you would know since I've left the company, but I think that um, this approach we now know is is here to stay. And uh, it's something that, you know, to some extent, you know, Blackthorn pioneered a little bit within this space of neuropsychiatry, but certainly uh, Janssen is, is picking up on it. Other companies will continue to, to use this approach, which ties back into you know, the electricity of the 21st century as we think about uh, powering our understanding of, of uh, both brain mechanisms of, of, of function and, and, and pathophysiology, as well as how we modulate that. And then another, I think, again, looking at how we dovetail and not have you all over the place. <laughs> We're doing really well. It's good. So th there's, um, you know, we, we all know, we know that you describe what, you know, what, one does in an academic lab, which is um, you get money, you get a team, <laughs> you test a hypothesis, and that's not very different. It's just the resources that you have, or you know, the connections that you have, and whether you how big is your team, and it, does it include chemists, and does it include you know? So, but but I'm just going to kind of pull that back and talk about you know what the as you're doing those you know, those experiments, there are going to be a lot of failures. And so when you're thinking about like, you know, first in class therapeutics, um, and there, there's a lot that you learn within the, within a company, within a team, um, probably a lot of those don't get out <laughs> into the public realm. And so um, do, do you, do you think that that there's a way to think about getting that information out more broadly 
um, you know, once, you know, once it's clear, oh, this has failed, that we've learned a lot, other people should learn a lot. And, and that, I don't mean that to be exclusive to industry, of course, that is also true, <laughs> you know, across research. In fact, it's a little bit even yeah. worse in my experience, yeah. yeah. So let's make it broadly about not just, you know, in drug development, but also within, you know, within our research labs. So yeah, how do we think about getting that information out? I think that when I've talked about some of the advances that has been through this data sharing, and I think that um, you know effective data sharing is has been a topic in the neuroscience community for some time. It's um, in the in the industry setting. We just start to tie it back to vaccines when you want to speak to the unbelievable transparency. I think you know not just J and J, but all companies have posted their protocols. Let's not wait for failures. <laughs> Let's wait for like, here's how we're designing our trial and people see like real time safety information. It's amazing degree of transparency, which I don't know is viable, you know, in perpetuity, but it's really, and you're talking about something, uh, you know, related to, you know, global public health. I think that uh, winds up serving as a model to say, well, what else can we do for, for situations of that magnitude? The opportunities around you know, data sharing in Alzheimer's, I think there's a lot of work that's underway. So you said that the data don't necessarily get out. You know, in part, that's a, that's a friction. I think it's less, it's less like, oh, we want to keep our data. It's more like, gosh, the amount of work required to de-identify and whatever put data into a public domain is really challenging. That being said, um, J&J &J, as an example has done that. So they have a, a, a repository at Yale. I think it's, it's the acronym is YODA is something around the Yale something data uh, repository and um, and Jane J is is placed uh, I don't know ten or twenty thousand subjects worth of data in the schizophrenia and antipsychotic space into that public domain now public you have to still request it with this data access agreements and all those different things but you know that's a good example of you know if if others can benefit from it, then and th then they should sort of make a proposal and, and find ways to, to do that because we really do want to not just reduce failures, but I think you know plan better, you know plan for success more effectively. So uh, it, it is this is another instance of I think a, a broader uh, uh, ecosystem commitment, scientific ecosystem commitment to data sharing and transparency regardless of sector and it needs to be embraced for the betterment of human health. Well, I, I really resonate with so much of what, it is awesome what you're saying. One of the perpetuity questions, you know, like this is an amazing moment for science as you really nicely put it before. And one of the, as you just said, the openness that's gone on in trying to address this huge challenge you know, one of the one of the limitations is how do we keep that kind of data in perpetuity? Not to get into the details, but that's a huge opportunity. But it takes a kind of systematic, not-for-profit, governmental commitment to get over that hump. And then you think about international questions. Like, is is there a path forward for that kind of immortalization of data? Is that something that you talk yeah. about partner with Yale versus another place? You know, there isn't like an accepted bank for that sort of thing. And I think that the NIH tries to do this, right? So you do have the the various data repositories within the NIH, and I think there's a, you know, as a funded investigator, you you make a commitment to make those data available. Um, so there is an effort to centralize, but this is a really good example is, you know, what's the proportion of resources that goes towards that versus something else, right? And I think that do we have that proportion right? So I'm totally making up this number, but is it 1% that we invest in sort of data archiving when realistically it should be 5% or something? It should probably be 5X whatever it is. We can sort of fill in the percentages later. Um, because ultimately, you know, I'm a big believer in this notion of a kind of an integrated learning system, a knowledge system, which, which we are generating, which to some extent, going back to the AIML question, which, you know, this is what we're interrogating in many instances is, is much larger data sets, often aggregated data sets, you know, if you can arrive at a common data model and things like that. So I think that this is something that will be embraced, but it's going to, like most things, the in the extent to which it's embraced is going to be informed by in, the incentive structure. Thinking about how to enable collaboration, right? You, you talked a lot about the importance of team science. Agree, a thousand <laughs> percent. And, you know, that doesn't mean it's the only approach to great discoveries. It, it just means it's an important part of 
I think, how to move and how to advance science forward in a number of different areas. Um, and that collective, that collective attention to a particular, you know, <laughs> goal or disease or whatever that is, and bring all of these different elements together. And so there's a question about, you know, how do you, uh, how do you think we can actually increase interactions between um, sci phenomenal scientists in both, sec you know, multiple sectors, industry, academia? Um, what, what do you, have you had, you obviously had a lot of experience with that, I mean to say, have you, but like, is there some, you know, can you generalize, can you say like, uh, like this, <laughs> if you don't have this and this and this, it's, it's not going to work, but if you have, you know, common, common culture, I don't know, like, what, what is it that you found in your experience that really allows those collaborations to work brilliantly well, and to continue to be enduring, not to be like this momentary thing, and then everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think collaborations work well, whether they're within or between institutions, whether they're, you know, within or between sectors, um, you know, through this common purpose. And I think this idea of whatever we can do to reduce the friction that's associated with those types of collaborations is, is that much more useful in advancing the collaboration. This is a big concern. It's like one looks at something really daunting. Oh my gosh, you know, try to do an agreement with the University of California, broadly speaking, and they have all of their templates and, you know, you're going to go back and forth with six months of, of legal discussion and back. It's just like, then let me go do something with Stanford that has less of that, or I'm making these examples up, but I mean, that type of mentality. And I think that, um, you know, having institutions going back to the question of the framework of applied versus um, versus basic, having institutions that actually embrace the the crosstalk as well, right? So that that don't see don't penalize investigators for wanting to have a, a relationship with a company or with a, you know an industrial lab or whatever it might be, you know, I think that's another instance that it really supports effective collaborations. But ultimately, it comes back to, you know, it comes back to people in science. So I want to work with these people. Do I want to work on this problem? Is the shared problem? Do we bring different complementary skill sets together? I think the answer to that routinely is yes. Again, whether within or between institutions, uh, you know, innovation happens at the intersections. That's one of the things that's so cool about Brown is that, you know, you can have teams of people that you might not even know which departments they're in. Like to me, that's almost the, the golden opportunity because it means that they're putting that collective purpose, that sort of scientific question above whatever they might be doing within their sort of, you know, department, laboratory, whatever. And, um, you know, I think the more that we can identify those opportunities, the better we'll be, again, as a larger ecosystem, as a society. Chris, I wanted to ask this, is that okay? But just, so, it's like a really kind of broad question, but I think very, Interesting. Have you ever had a really good idea for which you couldn't find a funder or a backer? <laughs> like, <laughs> all the time. You're asking me that question? Oh, I mean, well, the question is, how do I know it's a really good idea, right? But, um, but I think this this idea around, um, you know, timing matters. I think that there's an expression of, you know, in Silicon Valley, whatever, being early is the same as being wrong. And I used to talk about this with my team at Blackthorn. I would say, well, the last thing we want to be, you know, is the is the next Friendster. And they're like, what's Friendster? Exactly. Yeah, everyone knows what Facebook is, <laughs> you know, that actually licensed Friendster's patents, but you don't know what Friendster is. So, and so I think that this, this notion of timing is really important. And, and we go back to, you know, the CRISPR-Cas9 example. I don't know, somebody went and said, I'm going to use this, like, bacterium system innate immunity to sort of identify gene editing like I don't think that would have been funded would it <laughs> I, I just I can't imagine so I think that this idea of really recognizing where the field is and being able to either have you know the brute force ability to plow through it in the case of you know some Nobel Prize winning work or you know the um, the ability to again going back to the base camp you know, while you recognize what the overall vision is along the path, there's going to be multiple different things that need to be done. You're just going to ask people to fund those things. And I think that's something uh, that's consistent with, you know, when you fund good ideas, you know, you start a business, yes, you have a big vision, 
but ultimately you have inflection points that are meant to be value creating inflection points that you articulate and, and design and execute against. And that's the way you sort of, you know, build confidence in a, an overall idea or overall vision. And I'm sure the same happens, you know, in the grant writing world. Thinking about like the starting up a, you know, small biotech company looking for, for venture capital. Do you, look, I know all these things are going to be important, but in the end, how much of a present, how much of, a, of the likelihood that one will get funded depends on presentation versus idea. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of questions from <laughs> want to be starting up companies. And I know the answer to that in our own <laughs> and But like, I just curious. Yeah, I don't, it's not even just, I don't even think it's just in companies. I think the presentation of scientific information, the ability to distill something down to its essence is an art form and very few have it. And I might not even be one of those few. I, I just think that, you know, I, you know, I go back and sometimes I, I read classic papers just to sort of see everyone's gone back and I think I've read, you know, Watson and Crick and, and probably gone back and read some of Stan Prusner's early work. Like think about how they were presenting ideas against the backdrop of the scientific landscape. You can go all the way back to Darwin if you want. Like the, the thoughtfulness there really does sort of translate into uptake. And I think in the case of, you know, a, a venture backed company, it's that and many more things. It comes down to people, it comes down to timing, all of those different components. But the, the, the need to develop these kind of communication and presentation skills, um, I think can't be overstated. It's something that just won't go away. We might do this for the next 20 years, but we still have to be able to talk to each other. And I still have to be able to convey my ideas to you succinctly and effectively. Do you want to just go out on a limb here, Bill? And if I asked you what percentage of really great ideas get lost because of poor presentation? Like, it just... <laughs> yeah, it's hard to quantify. I love trying to quantify it, but this is like... Um, I would actually think about it the other way, right? So a quantal release side of it is like, how many different molecules do you need to have to actually convey, you know, a signal? And I think that that's, you know, the flip side of it is like being able to identify what's essential within that packet <laughs> is, is um, absolutely critical. I don't know. I would almost turn it back to you and see what, what have you seen in your experience as a grant review or whatever it is. I'm now on the receiving end of pitches and, you know, we're coming out of a cycle so-called virtual JP Morgan week, which even though we didn't all fly to San Francisco and meet face to face, we still had those types of meetings that really do set the stage for the business, you know, the science and business for the year to some extent. And I'm astonished. I can give you, I can quantify it on that basis. There's probably been 30 of those that I've attended in the last three weeks and a solid, um, you know, probably 20%, I think could almost be dismissed out of hand based on just the presentation, even though there probably is a good idea there. The issue is not whether there's a good idea, it's how hard do I have to work to unearth that idea? And I think that's the key that people are missing is that you, the, going back to reducing friction, it's our job as scientific communicators to reduce the friction on the recipient of that information. And not just in the technical context, by the way, as a scientist citizen, I think we have to do the same for the broader society if we want society to appreciate the investments in research that we're advocating for. Gatekeepers. <laughs> and then how many things are being thrown at the gatekeeper and like how much time do you have to be able to dig in or not? You know, and I, I, I think that that's really, um, really an important point. And, but just to reemphasize to the students out there, and <laughs> it, that, that, that ability to, to, to synthesize and condense an idea into, into this, you know, um, really effective moment because you just have like two minutes <laughs> to deliver. Let, let me emphasize for you because I can give, give an example. You know, I did my postdoc with Alan Bassbaum, as you know, at UCSF, and we had lab meetings. It was a pretty big lab. And when we presented, we had about five minutes and it was ruthless, right? It was like a data update or whatever. You, yes, you don't have all of your controls. Yes, you haven't done everything. But the ruthlessness that I think that experience, you know, kind of produced or the, the outcome of that 
is this, first of all, uh, thankful for the willingness of people to give that kind of feedback and input, or again, recognize good intent. And secondly, I don't think I could have done what I've done, you know, without that type of experience. It's not just about having thick skin, it's about being able to listen to that input. What did I get wrong? What did I not convey? And to be able to go back and refine that uh, on a sort of daily, weekly, monthly basis. Yeah, that's, I, you know, you're talking about communication and people somehow think it's either a gift or it happens magically if you get super prepared, <laughs> right? And it's about practice, just like anything else. So people taking the opportunity in lab meetings, people taking the opportunity, anytime they have a chance to lead a journal club is a chance to hone that skill. It doesn't have to just be your idea. It could be how you get to the crux of a paper or something, right? It's practice and training. You can't practice the wrong thing. You're training, there's a training element here. And I think that- And that there should be more formal training and what does it mean to give you know, the big picture first, middle and last to make sure no one misses it and th those fundamental skills. Mm -hmm. I completely agree that doesn't, should, should be just baked into the way we do the, the educating process, right? Well, it's something that, um, you know, I, uh, I spent some time you know, through my work with the Society for Neuroscience and, and, and government and public affairs, you know, in science advocacy. And I think, you know, being able to go speak with legislators, legislative assistants, whatever, and convey the big picture uh, of the investment in science. Um, you know, that's something I always think about. There are the skills that you develop, like in your sort of day job, right? These are my core skills. And they're the, the ancillary activities that reinforce you know, the training that winds up contributing to overall effectiveness. And so, you know, it's been a, another gift of mine to be able to participate in, in those contexts and, and hopefully at the same time, selfishly help move the field forward a little bit. So could you say a little bit more about government advocacy? <laughs> right, when you, you know, um, I've seen you do this and um, anyone out there, if you want a spokesperson, <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy <laughs> you want but I just I'm really interested in what what you've seen it's I, I know that you believe that this is really important I, I, um, and you've got to be there to be heard if you're not there you're not heard and you're not on the minds of uh, you know of, of government um, but can you can you tell me a little bit more about what what brought you to that process what you know a little bit about advocacy and and also perhaps do you remember an example where there was this like aha moment when you were talking to a senator and a congressperson and <laughs> and you really had an impact and you're like wow this is worth it yeah <laughs> I think it, a scientist. I think a couple of those things I think that um, first goes back to I think early on you know seeing myself as part of this larger whole right you have this common purpose it needs to be realized as part of a broader ecosystem. So as you know, I mean, I was, first of all, you know, I was funded by NIH support, you know, through up into and through my postdoc. And it's hard for people to imagine, but it's, uh, this was before the so-called NIH doubling, right? So there's always like, oh gosh, things are really tight. And we have to say, well, you should have imagined what it was like in like 1998 or whatever it was. And even that was, I think the culmination of NIH doubling this notion that the decade of the brain and getting that out there um, was really important for setting this setting the stage for the work that we do. And I bring that up because this is truly a journey. I mean, everything that we do to some extent has a sort of journey aspect to it. But when you think about advocacy, it's not one time, it's it's year in, year out, ideally to some of it, to some extent, even day or, or, or weekly, if you can do that. So I think um, that's the first thing is I, I came to that because I just saw that this is a way of advancing, you know, the overall sort of commitment to helping the world be a better place uh, through science and medicine. I think in terms of concretely, um, the brain initiative, which, you know, when it was released, there's lots of people want to quibble about the details, but the brain initiative was super cool. I mean, it was by, def by definition, something that was going to be you know, at the intersections of uh, various disciplines within science and within neuroscience. And, and it was going to actually be a, a provide a framework to bring, you know, academic and, and industrial scientists together and, and a base through which we could actually invest and realize the benefit of those investments. And that's something that really start, I, don't, I shouldn't say it started, but that is a, I was part of a conversation in a congressperson's office, congressman's, congressman's office, 
you know, around the time that that work was happening. So things like the brain initiative don't just happen by accident. Like, you know, we read reports, we see the people who are on the committee, but the work that preceded that was absolutely essential to its uh, success. And I think lastly, I would say is, you know, through over the last you know, decade or so or more, you know, when the economy has undergone, you know, series of downturns, yes, NIH budget can sometimes take a hit, take a hit, but over the longer term trajectory, the investments of science has, investment in science by the federal government, by the NIH has remained a bipartisan activity. And I think this is a really important concept, you know, for where we are today, seeing the power of science and medicine to help, you know, improve society. The NIH is core to that, that's foundational to it, which is why we don't think about basic and applied research, we think about research. And I think that, you know, no matter where you come from at whatever part of your journey, it's absolutely essential that you participate in these types of activities. Thank you. And that's a call out to a lot of the students who are listening. <laughs> but, uh, it, it is really important and, um, you know, lots of ways to do it. Bill and I will advertise this site for neuroscience, but like it, 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 if you're not going to do it, someone else is going to be doing it. And you don't want someone else doing it. <laughs> you know what they're going to say. Um, Chris, there's a couple of questions about kind of career advice. That, do you want to take that? And then I'll close out. We, I can't do that. We always say- I was flown. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so here's here's one of the questions. Uh, would would you recommend students who aspire to be VC investors in CNS Therapeutics or Neurobiology Biotech CEO should they get a PhD in neuroscience? Is that the right move? Uh, I, mean, I don't even know what the uh, to me. Why wouldn't you get a PhD in neuroscience if you could, regardless of what you think the endpoint is? Like the brain is super cool. The work that we do is, is important and it will be important for the foreseeable future. I think it, uh, the, an extension of what I said about my undergraduate training is, you know, as a, to go on and do graduate work and to the rigor, scientific rigor, collaboration, mentorship, all of those different components, these are the sort of foundational skills you need no matter what job you're going to pursue to, my, to some extent. You know, is it the most efficient for some jobs? Maybe not, but if you have the wherewithal and the intellect to, to get a PhD in neuroscience, absolutely do it. All right, fabulous. <laughs> Thank you for that statement. Uh, another thing I just wanted to make sure I caught, I, I really love your statement about the opportunity for a really bipartisan I mean, something we can agree on is health. And the, the, the role science can play in health is not a debated topic. And if there's ever been an advertisement for that, for all of the, you know, the questions about it, it's right now. <clears throat> that feels like a really good starting point for some broader issues that might be, you know, finding detente almost in, mm -hmm. in the community. And that's, that's a really neat, really neat idea that maybe science, this part of science could get us there, right? So hopefully we can communicate with the community in ways that creates that. Right. Um, Dan, did you want to? Yeah, I actually don't want to stop talking, but I think we have to. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, this was great. <laughs> it was really fun. I hope, I just want to thank, of course, um, Bill, thank you for joining us. Um, we know you're really busy. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting. Um, I think we got, I learned more about you than <laughs> and you. It's just great to hear, you know, the career trajectory of people who are really successful, but also have that link back to the roots, you know, undergrad, grad uh, experiences um, and all the many things that you've done, but how they, ju they just kind of fit together, right? I think you, you really, showed us how each experience can really build the person, you know, and everything that, that, that you're doing that moment. So thank you, it was just fabulous. Thanks so much for having me, it's been fun. Thank you, obviously, <laughs> always fun. Um, I mean, I, my, my quick takeaway, I mean, just in a few words, but I think, you know, this is a great moment in science and I think we should all be just, in all of what our colleagues have done, but also pretty motivated 
um, for what is possible in the future. And as Bill and Chris and I were talking about just before this, the yeah, chronic, chronic mental illness, psychiatric, neurological disorders, they're just there, they're there. And we should never take that for granted. Um, these things are curable. Like it's, it's, it's just when and how, but there's nothing magical. It's just, we've got to get the right targets and we, we need more basic research. We need more information. We need more pathways and we need more mechanisms. But these, these disorders and diseases are curable, or at least we can change the trajectory, which would be huge. Um, and thanks Bill for, you know, just reinforcing the importance of like determination <laughs> and never being satisfied with <laughs> with what we did today and you can always do better tomorrow but I just think you know just go for you know bring all the all of the experience we've had together to to, to to make the world a better place I mean that's that's my sense of what we just heard from you today um we will be in conversation um on February the 23rd at three o'clock with uh, Karen Fury, um, who's the um, chief of neurology um, at Brown. And she has a, she has, she is the Samuel Kenninson and Bertha Kenninson Professor of Clinical Neuroscience. Um, and so uh, Dr. Karen Fury will be with us talking about COVID-19 and the brain. So look out for that. Um, email from us and join us uh, for that event. Um, so it is for me to just thank everyone for being here. Thank you for the questions. Um, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to access the recording whenever you wish. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.